who don't know what this book is, this is a book of names. These are names who have asked us for prayer. They're not necessarily prayer requests. If you have a prayer request, you can give it to Pastor Woody, myself, or if you're online, you can mail it in. This is a book of names of people who want to be prayed over on a daily basis. And we do. We pray over them every time we're here at church, whatever the event may be. Most of us pray over this book at the house when uh, we're praying in our own personal prayers. If you will... Uh, Put, if you will send it in or if you put your name in it and get with Pastor Woody and if you're online if you'll send in a good address Pastor Woody will send you a, a decal that says Rockin' Country Church is praying for you and again we do pray for every book name in this book we pray for everyone we know and we pray for people we don't know because we, we know that prayer is the answer to all mm -hmm. questions gentlemen if you'll remove your hats again dear Lord we thank you for the opportunity to lift each and every one of these names up. We ask that you will touch them and, and fulfill whatever needs they may have, Lord. We just know that you are the great healer, that everything in this world is because of you. And whatever our request may be, as long as it falls within your will, you will supply it, Lord. We just have to, to be patient because you know when it's right for us. We thank you for all the community lord we ask that you'll lay your hands upon each and every person in this community we thank you for pastor woody we ask that you will fill him with your spirit and allow him to deliver the message you have given him today we pray that you'll touch our uh our tithes and offerings lord and allow it to use it in the way you want us to use it and we just ask you'll be with all the churches in this area lord just lift them up and allow them to speak your word in jesus name we pray these things amen 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 god bless y'all good morning rocking country church as you can see, uh, we are a praying church, right? We believe wholeheartedly in prayer. Why? Because prayer is just talking to God. Wouldn't you want to talk to the God? Wouldn't you want to talk to who provides everything you need? Well, I talked to my wife, but she don't provide everything I need. I don't know why. I think she should, but anyway. Because she's not my supplier, right? God is. Amen, amen. Uh, we've got one child, so I guess we have child church again today. And... Uh, Brother Bob, or Tater Taught, is going to go back with Miss uh, Terry here in just a second. And uh, yes, sir. Okay. All right. That sounds like a good idea. And uh, so let's, uh, as you, I said just a minute ago, we are praying church. So let's go to the Lord in prayer with that. And we'll pray up our children's ministry and our message for the day. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for each and every day. Father, we thank you for, the, for your abiding presence in our lives each and every day, Lord. Be with us today, God, and direct all things. Open up our hearts, minds, souls, and spirits to receive your word today so that we may come to a better understanding of the love that you have for us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Father, be with Miss Terry as she teaches the word of God to uh, Brother Bobby back there and uh, let him understand and, and come to know that love as well. Father, be with us, guide and direct everything and all things for your glory and your glory alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's go ahead and go back. Hey, uh, we have our fellowship luncheon today. And uh, as Chris said earlier, it doesn't matter if you brought anything or not. We got plenty of chow. So please stay with us and in fellowship with us. That's really the more, most important part is the fellowship. We do, uh, we do like to eat. There ain't no doubt about that. You can tell. Uh, but, uh, but, but stay in fellowship with us because that's really more important, right? It is. It is. Our fellowship with one another is far more important than, uh, than getting child because we can get child anywhere except McDonald's. But uh, uh, anyway, so join us for that. I want to talk a little, just a little bit real quickly real quickly i guess that's a word uh real fastly how's that um about our uh children's uh, uh christmas for kids yesterday uh we had a good time uh, we had plenty of volunteers i was uh a little disappointed and then again a little uh, glad that we didn't have as many families as we normally have we normally have over 50 families we only had 22 families that's all, just 22. Now, that can be an indication that, A, the word didn't get out, which would not be good, or it could be an indication that people are doing a little bit better, which that would be awesome, right? 
Yeah, we want people to be able to be successful. God wants you to be prosperous. Now, uh, we don't preach a prosperous message or the message of prosperity here, but God does tell us over in Philippians 4 that he will supply all of your needs, all of your needs according to the riches and glory in Christ, Christ Jesus for his glory. So God's, if God's supplying all the needs for Kemp, for this area here, Seven Point, Cedar Creek area, so be it, man. Glory to God, amen. We don't give any glory to anybody else. We give it to God and God alone, right? Certainly not our <clears throat> president. I didn't say that. Anyway, let's get on with our teaching today. Um, we taught last week, or I shared with you last week, as we searched through John 3, uh, 1 through... This is in my way, Chris. How does it come off? I don't like that there. Please make it disappear. Well, that was easy enough. Thank you. All right. Thank you, buddy. Uh, we were uh, we shared John 3, 1 through uh, 10. And Jesus in, in John 3 and 7 made a very, very, very profound statement. A very um, uh, in, fact, in fact statement. He said... You must be born again. He didn't say it'd be a good idea. He didn't say, well, you know, you might want to think about it. He said, you must be born again. In order, he, he also said in uh, John 3, 1 through 10, he said in one place, he says, in order to see the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Another area, he said, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. So wouldn't you think it's very, very important if, that we get born again? It's very important. It's vital. You will not understand the scriptures. You will not understand your Bible. You will not understand prayer. You will not understand what church is really about. You will not understand Christ because you can't see Christ if you're not born again. You will not enter into heaven unless you are born again. Jesus said that, not me. I'm not passing judgment. I'm not just judging anybody. I'm not saying you're saved or you're not saved. That's between you and God. But Jesus said, unless you're born again, you will not enter into heaven. So it's pretty darn important that we understand that we must be born again. And we talked about that last week, I think, in, in depth. Uh, but we, we have to conceive that. I mean, we have to, it has to enter into our very spirit. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, you know, we don't have to attend, ter attend church. Uh, we don't have to read our Bibles. We don't have to, to uh, claim that we believe, if you will. Uh, we don't have to be baptized in water. These are things that we do. These are things that we do in order to show other people that we have been born again. This is how important it is. You cannot show people that you've been born again just through your, through your, meet your actions, if you will, if you have not been born again. Why? Because it'll be false. It won't be true. Jesus says you must be born again. In order to see the kingdom of God, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. And if you're not, we got problems. Actually, we don't. You do. Because most of us, and I hope everybody here, understands that you must be born again. Jesus didn't lie. He didn't just say, hey, it'd be a good idea. He said, you must be. That's pretty f profound, don't you think? These physical things that we do are because of the spiritual thing that has happened in us, which is our rebirth. When we were born again. And there has to be, there has to be evidence of that rebirth. Evidence of that rebirth. I shared that last week. There has to be evidence for others to see that you have been reborn. But more so than that, there has to be evidence for you to see that you've been reborn. What? What? Why do I need evidence to see that I've been reborn? I say I've been reborn, so I've been reborn. Not so. Not so. Why? Because you don't do anything to make you reborn. You do nothing. There's nothing that you can do to be reborn because it is an act of God. 
It is something that God does, not you. Certainly you have a, a little part in it. You have to receive God's gift, forgiveness. You have to receive God's love. But you do not reborn yourself. That's what Nicodemus was saying. He says, he says have I got to go back into my mom's womb again? Well, certainly not. Because it's not reborn in the physical. It's reborn in, in the spiritual. And that's what we, we covered that last week, right? We must understand this. Over in Ephesians 2, 8, it tells us, For by grace you have been saved, okay, which means to be reborn. Through faith, not of yourself, for it is a gift of God. It's a gift of God. God does the work, not you. You just simply receive the gift. How many of you have gone to Walmart so far this year and bought my Christmas, I mean bought Christmas gifts? I, I'm just teasing, okay? How many of you have gone and bought Christmas gifts? Okay, you, a bunch of you. So you, okay, maybe not just Walmart, other places too, I guess. I guess there's other stores. But anyway, uh, you go into a store and what do you do? You take money and you exchange it and you receive something in return, right? And then you take that, whatever it happens to be, and you give it to your pastor. I mean, you give it to other people. I'm just teasing with that, okay? You give it to other people, and you don't expect anything in return. You don't, you don't go to them and say, hey, I gave you this, by the way, I paid $59.99 for it plus tax. You don't do that. That's not what you do. You know what Jesus did for you? He went into heaven's quote-unquote Walmart, if there is one, but he went into heaven, and he paid your price and my price, and then he brings that gift to you, and he says, here. Okay, so how much you pay for it? He paid with his life. He paid with his very life. You are not saved without a cost. You did not receive your salvation. You are not reborn. You are not a Christian, if you will, without a cost. The only difference is you don't have to pay anything because it's been paid. And he paid with his very life. He paid with his very life. What did he exchange for your salvation? It wasn't money. It was his blood, his life-giving blood. He gave his life-giving blood for you and for me. God showed evidence. God showed evidence. Let's go over to Romans, book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 13. Romans, chapter 8, verse 13. Romans chapter 8, verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God and daughters, no doubt. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. It is done by God. It is done by the Holy Spirit. It is not done by you. Let's look at 1 Peter First Peter one, uh, three, no, First Peter one. I'm sorry, First Peter one. Now I have mine marked so I can get there a little quicker than you, but I'll wait. First Peter one, and for anyone who is uh, new, by the way, you know that we are. Uh, we know if we've been going here for some time that we go through scripture. 
and we look at scriptures because teaching and learning the word of God is what is is the only way we, we, we can know Jesus, right? It is the only way we can know Jesus. All right, first Peter one three through five. Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten, begotten, that means of God, born of God, made of God, reborn of God, however you want to call it. That means of God. We'll look at that again in just a minute over in John. Begotten us, Again, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved for you in heaven, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. This is the power of God that works in you. It is God doing this, not you. God reborns you, if you will. You don't do it. Only God can do it. You see how much God loves you? God reborn you in spite of you. He reborn me. I know that ain't proper English, but I ain't real proper anyway. But you understand it, I hope. He reborn me, if you will, in spite of me. I wouldn't have reborn me. But he loves me that much. And he doesn't love me any more than he loves you. We must understand it is an act of God. A free gift given to us. Nothing that we do except accept the gift. How many of you this, um, this Christmas when your kids come around this, that, and the other. You're going to, they're going to say, oh, I got you this big beautiful present. Okay. I mean, you're going to say, well, how much did it cost? Because I can reimburse you. You going to do that? No. How many of you are going to say, oh, now everybody says this. All parents say this all the time. Well, you shouldn't have spent so much. You want it and you know it. The bigger, the better. I tell my kids, yeah, if you want to give me something, make sure it's big and expensive. Take every penny you got. But I'm never going to turn it down. And some of the best gifts you could ever receive are gifts from the heart. Are they not? Yeah, gifts from the heart. God gave you his heart. He gave you a gift from his heart. And that gift was his beloved son, his begotten son, Jesus. He gave him to you and to me. Remember and never forget or ignore the fact that God purchased you away from your eternal death because that's where we were all headed. He purchased you away from that eternal death by the blood of Jesus, by the blood of his son, his one and only begotten son. God purchased you. You were not free. Your salvation was not free, but it is free to you. It's free to you. This is kind of what, go back to the book of John, Gospel of John. This is kind of what John 1, uh, I'm sorry, John 3, uh, 1 through 10 tells us. Now, we're going to look today at John 3, 11 through 21. John 3, 11 through 21. That's our scriptures for today. So let's start with John 11, uh, John 3, 11 and 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know. This is Jesus telling Nicodemus. Most assuredly, I say to you, we, know, we speak what we know and testify to what we have seen. Remember back up there where he says you cannot see the kingdom of God without being reborn? So that must mean that Jesus has been reborn, huh? Well, sure he was. We're going to talk about that this coming uh, few weeks. Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify to what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. 
If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? If you, don't, if you don't receive what is right before your eyes and believe it, how are you going to believe things that you do not see and things you do not understand? We're willing, we're willing to act like a church. But we don't need to act like a church. We need to be the church. We need to be the church. Verses 11 through 21 can actually be broken. This is just for your information, if you want. Can be broken down into four different sections. 11 and 12 is our first section. And it is the problem with unbelief. It is the problem with unbelief. Verses 13 through 17 is God's answer for our unbelief. Verses 18 through 20 are the results of unbelief. And verses, verse 20 is the results of being born again. It's the results of being born again. Let's turn to Matthew 15. Matthew 15. Very simple scripture, but one that, that God sees most of, I think he sees a lot of his church, maybe not most, hopefully not most, I wish not any, of his church being Matthew 15 verse 8 and 9 it says these people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me and in vain they worship me teaching as doctrines the as doctrine the commandments of men in other words the church originally started as the church or the way there was only one the way and it was the way of Christ and since then it has developed into many 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 different many 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 different types of churches if you will or denominations well we just believe this well we don't believe that well, is it in the Bible? Well, yeah, but we don't believe that. We don't accept that doctrine. So in other words, you rewrote the Bible for yourself. That kind of sounds like the guys on the bicycles, right? If you know about that religion or the other people that go around knocking on the door saying, hey, we don't believe in Jesus, but you can still go to heaven if you do enough work. You can never do enough work. What is enough work? Is it? Six days a week? Well, let's just say it's six days a week. What if you're sick two days? I, I don't get to go to heaven. I was sick. It can't be based on you. See, all other religions are based on you. Christianity is the only one that is not based on you. It is based on God the Father. It is the only one that is based on God. Why? Because we fell. Paul tells us over in Romans 3, no one is righteous, no, not one. We have all sh fallen short of the glory of God. So why in the world would we want to base it on ourselves? I don't. I want to base it on the one who can. Because he's the only one that can and the only one that did. We need to be the church. And there's only one church. There's only one church, not many, many different churches. Scripture says there's one church, and we simply need to follow his word. Let's go to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Verses 4 through 6. Paul is telling the church of Ephesus, and he's telling us, there is one body... Now, this is not, there's just one Woody, or there's just one Chris, or one Johnny. It is the one body which is the church, which is the body of Christ, which is all believers. But there's only one body, one faith. Well, how come we have so many different church denominations if there's only one faith? 
Scripture doesn't say, oh, yeah, there's Pentecostal, there's Baptist, there's um, Episcopalian, there's Catholic, there's this and that and the other. No, 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 no. Could you? The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says there's one faith. One baptism. One God. And Father of all, who is above all. And through all. And in you all. You all who are the church. There's only one. There's not a whole bunch of different ones. So why do we have to have a whole bunch of different ones? It's because man gets involved. You see, we start following man. We're not following the right man because there's only one man to follow, and that's Jesus Christ. He is, Colossians tell us, he is the full deity of the invisible God in human form. Jesus is God. It's just that simple. Manifested in, in man. A man that walked this earth for 33 and a half years. But yet, what do we want to do? Well, I just don't believe all that stuff, so I'm going to rewrite it so that it suits me. That's what religions do. That's why we don't have a religion. We have a relationship with that man that I'm speaking of, which is Jesus Christ. We can have a personal relationship with him. In order to do that, you must be reborn. You must be reborn. This is what Jesus is trying to let us know. We have heard the word because God has assigned preachers, teachers, evangelists that lead God in direct but always with the discerning of the power of the Holy Spirit living in us, 1 John 2, 24 through 27, with the power of the Holy Spirit living in us, guiding and directing us, leading us to understand or discern the Word of God. Not man's doctrine. Oh, well, the Bible was written by man. The Bible was written by man inspired by the Holy Spirit. Scripture clearly tells us it is by the power of the Holy Spirit directing these men to write these different verses that we know as our Bible. They simply listened, listened to God and wrote down what God said. Go to the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, God, Jesus, told uh, uh, John, he says, write these things down. And the Holy Spirit directed him to write the book of Revelation, which is the only book that has not come true, but will come true. So unbeliever beware. Unbeliever beware. The book of Revelation will happen. Well, when is it going to happen? We don't know. It could be happening, or the process is happening right now. That's going to bring about Christ's return. Oh, well, I've been hearing that for a thousand years. Well, the book of Hebrews says that people have heard it after year, after year, after year, after year, after year. And everything just remains the same. Well, one day, guess what? We're going to wake up in heaven, those that are believers. All right? Because Jesus is going to come back, and in the instant, in the twinkling of an eye, things are going to be changed. This whole world is going to be changed, and the church... The church, not this denomination or that denomination, but the church, the believers in Jesus Christ, are not going to be here. First Corinthians 15 tells us this. First Timothy, uh, is First Timothy, uh, Thessalonians 4. First Thessalonians 4 tells us this. Christ is going to come by. Revelation tells us this. We're going to be taken out. Oh, well, I don't believe rapture because rapture's not in the Bible, blah, 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 blah. Yes, it is. But if you don't study the Word, you'll never see it. It is in the Word. God tells us it's going to happen, so guess what? It's going to happen. We don't know when, but it's going to happen. Verse 13 through 15 of the book of John. Verse 
Verse 13, John 3, 13. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who came down from heaven. That is the son of man who is in heaven. Wow. Wow. No one has ascended into heaven. That means that there is absolutely no one up there except God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And that's it. At this time. Now we know over in Ephesians where God led a train back, Jesus led a train back up into heaven. He took the captives with them, with him. And now they are in heaven. But at the time of Jesus' writing here, there was no one, there were no, was, was, you got it. There wasn't anyone in heaven, okay? And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man be lifted up. For whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now let's back up a little bit. Let's look at 14. And when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man was lifted up. He had to be lifted up. Now, what is this a depiction of? Jesus is describing over in Numbers 20, Numbers 21, I think I have it written down. Uh, yeah, Numbers 21, 5 through 9. If uh, God was, is God ever displeased with us? Yeah, quite often, actually. Well, at one time in the Old Testament, God was displeased with his, uh, his people, the Hebrews. And so... God is God. He can do what he wants to do. You can't question it because you ain't God. All right? So God sent fiery snakes. This is Numbers 21, 5 through 9. God sent fiery snakes into his people. And when these people were bit, they died. They died. And the people cried out to Moses and said, Moses, what are we going to do? We can't, we can't conquer God's snakes. What, are we all just going to perish and die? And so Moses went to God because Moses was God's man. God, Moses went to God and said, hey, you know, hey, Dad, uh, let me talk to you about something here. Your, your folks is dying, and they're dying fast. Can we not stop this? And God said, told Moses, instructed Moses, make a fiery serpent and attach it to a pole and hold it up. And when the people see the fiery serpent on the pole and believe, they shall be healed. And that's exactly what happened. So what is that a depiction of? Let's bring it to the New Testament. Old Testament, is the New Testament concealed? New Testament, is the Old Testament revealed? Where do we look to see our sins? We look to the cross. Where do we see the bad things in our lives? We look to the cross. Because Jesus became your sin and my sin. He didn't just take our sins. He, scripture says he became our sin. And so when we look to the cross, we see our sins hanging on that cross instead of us hanging on that cross. And when we look to the Savior that shed his blood on the cross, our sins are healed. It's a depiction of the Old Testament. Our sins are healed. The harm that is in our life is healed. It is taken away. It is washed clean by the blood of Jesus. And no other blood in no other way. Only the precious blood of Jesus covers washes away doesn't just cover it washes away our sins and so when we look to the cross when we look to the pole we don't see the serpent on the pole we see our savior on the pole we see our savior verse 16 john 16 you all know this scripture does anybody not know this scripture? But you know what? Most people read this scripture, but they don't read the rest of the story. So let's read the rest of the story. Let's do 16 and 17 first. For God. You see that? For God. Not you. Not anybody else. For God. So loved the world. 
Well, I love people and I like to help people understand this a little bit better. Now, God loves everybody and he wants it. Matter of fact, he even tells us over in, uh, in John 6, uh, verse 42, 41, 42, something we're right there. He says, the will of God is for no one to perish. No, not one. Not one. He doesn't, God wants everybody to end up in heaven. It ain't going to happen, but he does. That's his will. That's what he wants. So where it says, but whosoever put your name there. Write in your Bible this one time. Write in your Bible and put your name there. Because when you open the scripture and you see that scripture, you need to know that that scripture is for God so loved you. For God so loved you. Because God, if you were the only person or the last person on this earth, God, would, Jesus would have died for you. Now, he will never have to die again, and he never will die again. He is eternal. He is going to last forever. He is waiting for us in heaven. He is interceding for us in heaven. He's still working for us. He's still going to the Father saying, hey, no, we've got to forgive Woody again because he's, he's one of your kids. No matter how many times he messes up. I died for him too. That's beyond my comprehension sometimes, but he did. For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son. Begotten means of God, from God, directly from God. In other words, God gave himself. We're going to see this whenever we see Emmanuel, God with us, the, the virgin birth of, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is God manifested in the flesh, being born, coming to this earth and dying for you and me. God himself gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have, have not may get or by, might get, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but through him, through Jesus, only through Jesus, not through anybody else, not through an idol, not through a, a, a golden lamb uh, or sheep or whatever they made, not through a, uh, something you can carve out of wood or out of metal and, and set on a, on, a, uh, on a table and worship, not something that you light candles around. No, no, no. Through him, through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. There is no other way to heaven except through Christ. It says it right here. For God did not send his son, his beloved son, his only begotten son. He did not send him into the world to condemn the world. But that the world through him might, might, might. Ooh. So there may be a condition there. Might be saved. It doesn't say that the world will be saved through him because that tells us when it says might, there's something that we must do. What did Jesus tell us we must do over in John 3 and 7? We must be born again. There is so much more in that must be born again than we ever can, that we ever even think about. Like I said, you can go to church all your life. You can read your Bible every day. You can even pray every day. You can do all the ritual things that you do. But that does not get you into heaven. Jesus says you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. You cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless you are born again. It's probably the most important scripture in scripture to understand. Because you cannot get to heaven unless you're born again. Oh, well, I got born again because I got baptized in every church I've ever been in. That's not being born again. We talked about this last week. Being born again is something that happens on the inside that God does to you. It's not something you do. It's something God does in you we're going to see this even more it's very important that we conceive that very important that we understand that very, very important that we that we 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 get it because you can go to church all you want you can be the goodest gooder person you ever seen in your life 
But you cannot get into heaven unless you are born again. And that comes through Jesus Christ alone. And not through anything else. Not even yourself. Not even yourself. Might be saved. You mean not everybody will be saved? No, they won't. The price is paid. The full price is paid. For every living person who has ever lived, the price has been paid for them to be saved. The opportunity is there. It was put on the cross. But you must look upon the cross and believe. You must understand what the cross is. That right there is a piece of wood hanging on a wall. But what that represents is the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord and Savior. And because he lives, we too shall live. You must believe. God explains this into greater detail. Look at verse 18. He explains it so easily that you'd have to get somebody to help you not understand it. I mean, it's pretty plain and simple. It's written in red and it's written in English where we can understand it. It's not written in some language that we don't understand. It's as plain as the nose on your face. In right there on, in verse uh, uh, 18, the first sentence, it says, He who believes in him, in Christ, is not condemned. How hard is that to understand? You want something to back that up? Romans 8, 1. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. Didn't say there wasn't conviction now. But there's no condemnation. There's no condemning those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus himself said, He who believes in him, believes in Jesus Christ, is not condemned. But look at the rest of it. But he who does not believe is condemned already. That's pretty easy to understand. It's just as easy as, as understanding those who are in Christ Jesus are not condemned. So the opposite of that is those who are not in Christ Jesus, guess what? They are condemned. Oh, but I'm a good Christian. I go to church. I've been going to church all my life. I read my Bible. I read it one time all the way through. Didn't understand it, but I still read it. I pray all the time. Well, so did the Pharisees. The Pharisees, they knew the Bible, their Bible, forwards and backwards. They knew God's laws, forwards and backwards. They prayed all the time. They, glorified, they tried to glorify God all the time. But one thing they didn't do, they didn't believe in Jesus Christ. I'm sorry to say that a lot of the Jews still do not believe. Why? Because they want to stick to their guns. We know what's right. We have a lot of churches that do that. Oh, never mind the Bible. We know what's right. The guy that started this church rewrote the doctrine, and that's, that's what it is. The two religions, I know you know who I'm talking about, the two religions that I talked about earlier a man sat down and says, well, I don't really agree with this, so I'm going to rewrite it. And from that, people say, oh, well, he must be right. He's a man of God. He's wrong. They're wrong. The inspired word of God is the only truth. That's it. That's why we don't teach anything else here. And we're not going to. Not as long as I'm alive. Because this is the only true word of God. I'll never teach out of another book. I'll only teach out of the word of God. Because this is the only thing I've got to stand on. This is the only truth that I believe. I know there's a lot of opinions. But Bubba's got one opinion, I got another. I think we're wearing the same shirt. I like mine better than yours though. It's my opinion. Okay? It's my opinion. It's the same way with these other guys who wrote these other Bibles, if you will. It's their opinion. It's not God's opinion. It's the reason that we have so many different uh, um, denominations. 
is because a group of guys got together, if you will. I'm sorry, ladies, but usually it was a group of guys that got together and said, oh, well, we don't believe that. We only believe this. Oh, we base it all on the Word of God. Well, then why do people have to do works in order to be saved? Why do people have to do this in, to be saved? Why do people have to be baptized in this church to be saved? Why do people have to be baptized in your water to be saved? The water baptism is nothing. It's only your public uh, proclamation of what you've already done in your spirit. We must follow this book, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, well, there's so many different Bibles, I don't know which one to follow. Now, I know. I know there's some that say only the New King James. And they're probably right because they're a lot smarter than me. And because they're a lot smarter than me, I have to use a different version because I ain't that smart. Matter of fact, I started reading some stuff in the King, in the King James uh, this morning just because I wanted to do some comparisons and stuff. And, and I do have a King James I study out of. But I start reading and I said, I can't talk like that. It doesn't come out right it just doesn't work for me, so I have to use the next best thing, so therefore we use the new King James because I can talk like this. Kinda. I don't do it justice, but I kinda. But my point is, is that the Word of God is the Word of God, and it is only the true, it is the only true God. It is the only true Word of God. Now, maybe structured a little bit differently. Some people like the Amplified Bible. I think that's way to expound it on myself. But some people like the Amplified Bible. The message is still the same. It's all about Jesus. So you get what you can understand and start there. But stay in the Word of God. Oh, but I read this book this, this guy wrote one time, and it was a really, really good book. And it's got to be true because he said it was. Verse 19, and this is the condemnation. This is the condemnation. That the light, which is Christ, has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light. You see, we like our sins more than we love our God. We prefer our sins over God. What did God tell us over in Exodus um, uh, 20, I think it is? Uh, yeah, Exodus 20. What did God tell us as far as the first commandment? What is the first commandment? I think we all know it, right? Thou shalt not, uh, King James here, thou shalt not have any God before me, right? That's his number one command. You shall not have any God before him. But yet... We put our sins before worshiping God. We put our sins before glorifying God. We put our sins before pleasing God. We put our sins before anything else sometimes. A lot of us do that in different ways. Not bad, bad sins. Hopefully nobody in here is a murderer or anything. By the way, this just came to mind. That poor little girl, seven years old, that the guy kidnapped and murdered, within, they say within an hour of him kidnapping her, that's pure evil. The guy definitely is, is evil in his heart. Pray for that family. The little girl's all right. God's already taken her to heaven. Okay, she's in heaven. But pray for that guy because he needs God in the worst way. He does. He does. I am, Terry and I were discussing that. Going over to the, uh, to the other church uh, Friday night. And praying that she's just lost. You know, she's in somebody's house and she's hiding somewhere or whatever. But I told Terry, I said, you know, I just, I don't feel that that's what it is. I feel that somebody has done something. And then, of course, we found out yesterday after evening that, sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Friends, there is evil in our world. Don't think that, that there's not. And God tells us in his word 
that in the last days, evil will abound. And it certainly is. I didn't mean to get off track, but just pray for that family, please. There is darkness, and man loves darkness than light. Why does he love darkness as opposed to light? Why does he love his sin instead of the light? Because the light will show his sins. Because the light shows his sin. Join us for our candlelight service on Christmas Eve. This is the message. This is the message. This is the purpose for candlelight service. The light shows the deeds. Jesus is the light. So in other words, you ain't going to get away with nothing. God knows everything. Oh, well, nobody's here. It's just me. No, God's there too. Well, see, I don't believe in God, so he's not, I don't have to worry about him. He's still there because God is everywhere at all times, whether you believe or not. Do you realize that our salvation does not depend on you and what you think? Our beliefs do not depend on you and what you think. Therefore, the Bible, does, when someone takes it and, and rewrites it, it does not depend on what they think. It depends on what God says. God's already wrote the book. <coughs> Nothing else needs to be added to it. Matter of fact, it tells us over in uh, Revelation 22, do not add to this and do not take from this. So we don't have to worry about what somebody else wrote. Please don't fall for what somebody else writes. Many people have, many people do. Scientology. Dumbest religion I've ever heard of. It's unbelievable. And I'm not trying to pick on them, but study some of their stuff. It's like, my gosh, how can people believe this? But they do. Matter of fact, millions do. Millions do. Verse 20. For everyone practicing evil hates the light. There it is right there. He's explaining it. And does not come into the light, lest his deeds be exposed. That's what I just shared. See, for whatever reason, and it's really kind of crazy, we love our misbehavior. We love our disobedience. We seem to. Because we, it just keeps growing and growing and growing. Scripture even tells us, sin will beget more sin, beget more sin, beget more sin. The more you sin, guess what? The more you're going to sin. At some point in time, you've got to put a stop to it. Well, I just can't stop. Yeah, you can. You stop. How simple is that? Well, that's just too simple. I have to go and have therapy. And I'm not saying anything against therapy, Brother Billy. Therapy is good. But how do you stop? And he'll tell you this. You stop. Whatever it is that God is telling you to stop, stop. Change your ways. Renew your mind. Become that new creation. James 4 and 17 tells us that if God tells you that it's a sin in your life and you don't stop, then guess what? It is a sin. You just have to stop. Nobody said it's easy. Lord knows I've had enough sins in my life that have ruled my life over the years that it was very difficult to stop unless I depended 100% on God. I've shared this with you guys before, and I don't mean to beat an old horse, but especially whenever he's down, but the, I smoked for 43 years. That's a hard habit to get rid of, right? Those of you who smoke know other people saying, oh, no, you just don't smoke. Well, no, it's difficult. It is difficult. But as I was going to church one night, God said, going to church one night, God said, quit smoking. I said, I don't want to. I like smoking. It ain't hurting nobody but me, right? God says, don't smoke for me, not for you, for me. Quit. And I said, well, fine. After arguing with him, and you don't argue with God, you're going to lose. And I said, but if, I, if you want me to quit, fine, but you got to take it away. And he took it away that night, that very night. I haven't smoked since. But see, that's the power of God. That's what God can do. You can't do it. So you rely on him to do it. Because he can do it. And I'm just using that because that's what happened in my life. Drinking was the same thing. So whatever it is in your life, 
don't try to do it on your own because you're not going to, most likely, you're not going to be able to do it. But God can. But God can. And He will. He will. As it told us over there in Matthew 15, there are those who try to flatter God. Is that right? Not, not flatter. F uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Imp yeah, impress God. Flattery is what I'm looking for. Okay? I just don't know if I'm saying it right. Like I said, I don't speak New King, uh, King James versions. So, uh, those who try to impress, that's a good word, God, as it told us over in Matthew 15, they're just doing it with their lips. It's just lip service. That's all it is. God says your heart is far away. So see, you bring your heart closer to God. James, the book of James again, draw near to God and he should draw near to you. You draw near to God and what will start coming out of your mouth are the good things. Things that God are truly, is truly impressed with because he's, he wants your heart first. And without your heart belonging to God, it belongs to you and it belongs to man. And, and that's not the best route to go. Just let God, let go and let God. Those who try to impress God, though they do, Christ, uh, they do church every Sunday, they read their Bible, they even pray. But their hearts are not for God. Their hearts are not with God. These are people who are not born again. Now, I'm not pointing fingers and I'm not casting judgment because God is the only one who saves and God is the only one who knows who is saved other than you. But if you have not, and we talked about this last week, if you have not seen a change in your life, if you have not seen a change in your life, if there's no evidence of your rebirth, you're probably not reborn because there has to be evidence because God changes the spirit. It changes completely and therefore the soul must follow and the body will follow. There has to be a change in you. And if there's no change, you might want to question your rebirth. God goes on to explain this to us. He says in verse 21, John 3 and 21. But he who does the truth comes to the light. That his deeds may be clearly seen. That they have been done by God. You see, it's God. Philippians, Philippians 1, 6. God will complete the work he has started in you. It is God working in you, not you working for God. It is God working in you that changes your life. You have to let him do it. And guys, we seem to have a big problem with that because we're so prideful. We don't want anybody to be our master. Well, you best let the master be the master. You be the sheep. I choose to be a sheep. And it's not bad. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. I want to be a follower of Christ. I want God to lead my life, guide me, direct me, and help me because I have messed it up for 50, 60 years. Well, maybe not 60 years because about 47 years, I think it was, 46, 47 years. I've messed it up. But when I truly became reborn, and submitted and, and surrendered to God. He's changed my life to the best life I've ever had. And what he'll do for me, he'll certainly do for you. What he's done for me, he'll certainly do for you. The good works. Ephesians 2. Let's go over to Ephesians 2. We, we touched on this a while ago. Ephesians 2, verse uh, 8 through 10. For by grace, for by grace, grace is God's love for you. Because God, don't rewrite the scripture, but put this in there. Because of God's love for you, because of God's love for you, you have been saved through faith. 
and not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Not of works, not of anything you do. Least anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ, created in Christ Jesus, reborn in Christ Jesus. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It is all God working in you, not you working for God. The good works that we do is evidence of Christ in us, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, in the works, in the ways of Christ. Jesus says, I'm the way, the, the truth, and the life. We have to follow Christ. We're not trying to portray uh, that we are better than anybody else or that we are judging other people. That's not why we do what we do. We just want to live a, the better life that God has called us to live. That's all. That's the only thing we're doing. We're not trying to say, well, you got to be a Christian if you want to be as good as me. Well, I'm still forgiven by grace because I still mess up. And if you've broken one sin, you've broken them all, uh, James 2.10. If there's sin in your life, then you're a sinner forgiven by grace. And we all are. But I want to please God, so I want to live the better life that God has in store for me. And in order to do that, I must follow Christ. I'm no better than anybody else, and nobody else is better than me, is the way I like to look at it. So are you walking in the old life, or has there been a rebirth, and you're now walking in a new life? I pray a new life. Each day we should do our best to progress and to become more and more and more like the Son of God in which we are called. Not to live as we would desire, knowing God will forgive, though. I mean, when we mess up, He is a forgiving God. He's a loving God. He says, I will forgive you. But walking as He has called us to, to walk, sharing the love He has for His one and only begotten Son, and the love he has shown for his begotten children, which all, is all those who have been saved. Begotten means to be of God, and to be reborn means to be born of God. Born of God. Last scripture, let's look at John, <coughs> Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 11. Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 11. He came into his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. So it is nothing that you do. But it is of God. See God is the only one. That can cause you if you will to be reborn. No one comes to the father. Unless they are called by God. God is the only one that saves. I want to be a child of the Most High God, and I claim that title. I didn't say I deserved that title, but I claim that title. And what allows me to in, impose upon you that I deserve that title? Because I deserve it. Why do I deserve it? Because of what Christ did in me and is doing in me and has done for me. And what he's done for me, he'll do the same for you. It is God's will that all shall be saved and none shall perish, but all shall believe in Jesus Christ, his one and only begotten Son, and shall receive the gift of eternal life. Well, I'll do that tomorrow. You may not have a tomorrow. We just had a service yesterday of Miss Evelyn, Miss Evelyn Layfield. 
Been coming to our church almost since day one. Been coming about nine years. I remember it at the other church. I saw that picture of her yesterday up on the screen, and, and that's just how I have always seen her. She has not changed in my book in nine years that I've known her. And she is a lady that you look upon and you just think that's anybody's mom and everybody's mom. She was just a sweet, sweet, sweet lady. Never had anything bad to say except about her husband, Dave. And I asked her one time, I said, so how's Dave doing? She goes, well, he's still sitting in front of the TV. And that's the only thing she ever said bad about Dave. She loved him. They were married a long, long, long time. She was a sweet, sweet, sweet lady. But she knew her time was coming. She was a firm believer in Jesus Christ as her Savior. She did not know when her time came, but it came last Monday. I believe it was last Monday. When all of a sudden, in the hospital, she just passed away. She went to sleep and she didn't wake up. She woke up in heaven. It's just that simple. It happens and it's going to happen to all of us unless Christ comes back. I am not guaranteed tomorrow. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. You know what? You're not guaranteed the next 10 minutes. You do not know when it's going to happen. But we do know according to scripture and we believe scripture. At some point it's going to happen. Unless Christ comes back and takes us to be with him. Well, I don't believe that. Well, fine. It doesn't matter what you believe because it doesn't depend on your belief. It depends on God. And God says it is appointed once for man to die. So we're going to die at some point in time. Terry and I were talking this morning. There's a friend of hers through UPS. She says, because we were reflecting on life, when, when it's going to be our time. You know, I'm 65. I, I know people, my best friend in high school died 22 years ago. What is today? The fourth? Okay, two days ago. No, yeah, two days ago on the 2nd of December, 2000, it's 2001, 2001. We buried my best friend in high school. He's five months younger than me. That was 21 years ago. I didn't know he was going to die. When we were out running the roads, doing the things boys shouldn't do, I didn't know he was going to die. He didn't know he was going to die. But he died. And we buried him December the 2nd, 2001. No, it wasn't. It was 2000. It was in the year 2000, so 22 years ago. He's younger than me. I don't know how old I was then, but my point is, is that we're not guaranteed tomorrow. So you better make up your mind today. Now, it's not to scare somebody into salvation because we can't. You cannot scare someone into salvation. I cannot save you. I cannot, I cannot make you be saved. You cannot make you be saved. It is God touching your heart, hopefully through this message today, telling you that you must be reborn. If you want to see the kingdom of heaven, if you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says you must be reborn. Not tomorrow. Today. Scripture tells us today is the day of salvation. So I hope and pray everybody, at least here, and everybody watching, is saved. We had some kids here in the city of Kemp committed suicide. We had a teacher die. It's just, it happens every day. And you don't know when your time's going to be, so you must be ready today. Jesus says, today is the day of your salvation. I love it where he says, and look, there's, 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 uh, there's death and there's life. And then he gives us the answer on which one to choose. How great is he? Hey, I'm going to give you the answer. This is the best one to choose, which is life. So when are you going to choose it? He's not talking about this life. 
Because this life starts at a time and ends at a time. He's talking about your eternal life. Your eternal life, which does not end. Our Jesus, our God, our Holy Spirit never ends. Never ends. It, they are eternal. And the promise is that we will receive eternal life. Eternal life with them. That's your choice. You can choose death or you can choose life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, if there's anyone who has not chosen life, I encourage you today to make that decision. Jesus tells us, God tells us, Old Testament, New Testament. He says, I give you today, and today is the day of your salvation. Choose life. There's death and life, and I'm telling you, choose life. And he is speaking of life eternal. And if you have not received Jesus as Lord and Savior, there is no other way to heaven except through Jesus Christ. John 14, 6. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. So if you have not received Jesus in your life as your Lord and your Savior, don't wait to try to get things cleaned up because you're not going to get there. Jesus tells us, I believe it's uh, John 14, 19, or 14, I think it's 19. He says, you cannot do anything without me. It's not the right scripture, but it is in the book of John. He says, you cannot do anything without me. So with him, you can receive eternal salvation. With him, you can live forever. With him, you can walk this earth until your time is up knowing your salvation is secure. Why? Not because of you, but because God loves you. Whosoever shall believe it in him shall not perish, but shall receive eternal life. What a promise. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. If that's you today and you have not received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I encourage you to, to receive him now. It's this simple, but you must mean it in your heart. You must mean it in your heart. Don't say it so somebody else can be impressed. Say it because you mean it, because God knows your heart. Just say, Dear Jesus, I don't understand this. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but I believe. I believe in the word of God that I've received today. I believe that I must be born again. So Jesus, come into my life. I ask you. Father, come into my life. I ask you. Holy Spirit, come into my life. I ask you that I may be reborn today and become a child of God. Only you can do it. And I trust that you will because you said you would. And I believe your word. And I thank you for it. Guide and direct me from this day forward. I shall live for you forever and ever and ever. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right. If anybody needs prayer for anything, grab my wife, please. Thank you. You knew. If anybody needs prayer for anything, please come forward and let us play, pray with you. If uh, you need prayer and can't come forward, we'll be happy to come back to you. Let's all stand for this song. This is our invitational song. And as we pray for others, I hope, if anybody needs prayer, as we pray for others, please just say a silent prayer to yourself. Uh, for other people. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, for other people and especially for this guy and this family who has just lost this little girl. Uh, for the people that are up, I think it's in Idaho where the four teenagers were killed and the college students and on and on and on and on and on. Pray for our world. Pray for our country. All right? In Jesus' name.